Good morning. Welcome to Spirit of Hope United Methodist Church. My name is Jerry Rubino. I'm the Minister of Music here and I'm thrilled to welcome you as well as our online audience to our worship service today. It's good to be in the house of God today, truly, and I hope that you are ready to participate with your mind, your heart, your emotions, and uh, looking forward to a really good day. So many people that I've spoken with lately have just commented about how beautiful the colors were this fall and just how much we just enjoy it and how quick it, quick it fades. So I have to keep looking for something else. So maybe a 10,000 foot mountain will do or a picture of the ocean or something like that. I call that God art for myself and I always am stimulated as that happens. It is the theme to the prelude today. When morning gilds the skies, my heart awakening cries. May Jesus Christ be praised. Thanks, Jerry. I'm not always sure on those preludes always when it's coming to an end, so sometimes, but that one was very clear. It was very obvious, so thank you. I appreciate that. It's beautiful. And I was thinking, too, now when people record music, they'll, they'll record a track, and then they'll record another track and layer it and layer it and layer it. Jerry does that with an organ 
all at one time. So the, this is the original recording laying down tracks on top of each other live. So thank you for that. Four tracks. Four, Four. tracks stereo. Four. Two feet, two hands. There you go. <laughs> and we could go on. Good morning. Uh, good to see you. Glad you're here. Welcome to you folks who are online with us. It's a Sunday morning and it looks and feels like November. Jerry's talking about the colors that went way longer than I expected this year. And now we have that, that other color that comes and stays sometimes for a long time. Um, it's nice and it's nice when it falls um, where you don't have to shovel it. So when it falls just on the grass, I like that. I'm glad you're here. Welcome into this space, this time. Deep breath, relax. Thank you, Jean and Carolyn, for the, the setup here. Makes us feel Thanksgiving-ish, or E, or whatever. So, we begin our worship with some singing. Let's sing together. As we gather, may your spirit work with you. chorus comes and goes so quickly that I think we need to sing it again and express this as in terms of the, the song of our heart and sing as we gather may your spirit work with as we gather may we glorify your name though we grow that as our hearts begin to worship we'll be blessed because we Our choruses have lyrics that we just have to think about and see if we really are singing them because we believe it, because it's on automatic pilot. What do we actually think? I'm not going to encourage you what to think. I just encourage you to think. Let's sing that one more time. Lord, we I lift your name, name on high. Oh, Lord, we lift Oh, 
us from separateness into, into a yet to be seen wholeness fullness completeness, completeness that, that is, is in process, process even, even now, now. Yes. yes amen, amen.
Sing praise to God who has shaped and sustains all creation. That would include the leaves we rake up and haul away, the trees we cut down and burn, the insects we swat and poison and curse for biting or stinging us. They're done doing that for a while. And the snow, S-N-O-W, that we allow to land only in places where we don't walk or drive. And aren't we also shaped and sustained in and in ways by that creation? So, we are part of this project of yours, God, not a part of it, nor can we survive without it. And you are in it too. Doesn't that make all of our living a blessed endeavor carried on, on in a holy place? Do we live like it is? Might we yet learn how in Christ? Amen. As you send that peace out maybe to people that you know of who are in particular need or in general as you send it across the hall folks or around the room in your living room, we um, pray for peace in this world as well. Some announcements, some of the usuals and some of the unusuals. Um, we're gonna have a, a short meeting, uh, those of us participating next Sunday's service after the service today. We're going to have one of our conversations, we call them tough questions, and we're gonna kick some things around. We have four or five people who'll be up here chewing over some things and inviting questions and thought as Jerry was doing with us this morning. So um, if, if you don't like that sort of thing, then next Sunday might not be your cup of tea. But it's just one Sunday and then we come back to our regular format. We're gonna change things up. And a change up is always good. We know that. Uh, Staff Parish will meet on Tuesday evening at 6.30. We were gonna meet last Thursday, but uh, enough people couldn't make the meeting, so we postponed, rescheduled, and we're still trying to figure out if we're gonna do it Zoom, in person, or some sort of hybrid, and how we do that. So stay tuned, those of you on Staff Parish. Bible study is at 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning on Zoom. The youth meet on Wednesday night, Wednesday evening at six o'clock in person here. There is food and we have a good time. On Thursday evening, the Reconciling Social Justice team will be meeting at 6.30, I believe that's the right time. We can check on that. Um, and as I said, next Sunday is a Tough Question Sunday and it's also a church conference Sunday. So we have a congregational meeting after the service. We'll just stay in here so we can live stream that as well so that uh, people who aren't here can participate in the meeting and um, vote on what you think I deserve for the coming year, salary-wise and otherwise. Um, I know that's really opening something up, isn't it? Um, we are online, and that means that there are cameras sometimes looking around the room, and they might catch you, or I might walk over here and a camera Somewhere might, yeah. So just be aware, you know, sort of smile, you're on candid camera perhaps. Some of you know that reference. Um, and with masks, we can't always tell if you're smiling, but um, bear with us and keep that in mind. And I just want to point out that Lisa volunteered and is back there at the computer learning how to be part of this, um, uh, allowing this uh, live stream to happen. So if you or someone you know uh, might be interested in learning how to play a part on Sunday morning, we're trying to expand that team a little bit so that people can have a rest. This has been going on a long time and we expect that it will continue even after we're back to whatever normal is. So um, we need to have a full complement of people who can rotate through and to help us provide the online service. So. There, how about that? Lots of announcements. And uh, we do have a little time with children, so we will sing you into place in front of your monitor TV, wherever you're at, and uh, we'll talk a little bit.
So, children, children, children. Let your inner child come forth. We are in the month of November, yes? And then comes December, and at the end of December, what happens? We have, we have Christmas, and then... But before the new year, the old year ends, right? So we have an ending that leads to a beginning. Isn't that interesting how that happens? Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, we take it for granted, but it, um, sometimes the endings are so abrupt and hard that we're not always sure that there will be a beginning, that there will be anything new to follow. And um, our reading today in the scripture um, is from a place in Mark that talks about endings and uh, rough endings, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. We always come into this this time of year with those texts that show up, those stories, those pronouncements. And it's uh, good for us to keep in mind that beginnings come after endings and new things do show up. Um, sometimes they're surprising. A little connection with the, the, um, the dog at our house and the little girl that now is with us five days a week um, all day long at our house, which makes for interesting work from home. Um, but we need not worry because Otis is watching her every second of the day. And if I pick her up and carry her around, he's right here. Um, and if we set her down, he's right there. And um, on Thursday, Tuesday or Thursday, whatever day it was, um, I was doing some a workout in our basement, we have some exercise stuff, and I was down there, and Julie brought Sora down um, so she could do some other things and thought, well, she might be entertained by watching me try to um, exercise. So she put her in this little chair that sits down on the floor and holds her up, so she's got things to hold her arms because she still, she flops over, though she can sit up. And I finished something and I came over and knelt down to say hi, and. Otis, who was on the basement steps, shot down and laid down on the floor between us. Just put himself right there. It's kind of like over my dead body, you know. <laughs> Which it just, again, impressed me that's wired into him. He's especially, as we've talked about, as I've talked about, a protector of females. Uh, human females, uh, canine females, and when he was in the dog park, he would find these girls that he kind of liked and he would just kind of circle around them and make sure that they didn't get harassed. He just does that sort of thing. Well, when Sora leaves, it's an ending. And Otis is very distressed by that because he doesn't know now how is he going to protect her if she's going out the door and he's not going with her. It's a hard ending. Every day is a hard ending for Otis. <laughs> but he's so excited when she comes the next day. So the ending leads to this beginning, and it, it, it gets him all excited. And in between, he crashes. Endings, beginnings, and in time, in between, the process, the, the time that we need to recuperate and find our way and figure things out maybe, well, we're coming to an ending, and maybe we do some of that figuring now and processing. And we might do some here. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, the days end and begin, seasons end and begin, life ends and begins. Help us to trust in you in all of that, knowing that every ending leads to a beginning of some sort, and it is all in you and your love. Thankfully, in Jesus' name, amen. I know I don't look like Elena, but um, 
she was to be here, but I, I am uh, filling in, and it, it's, uh, it's a rehearsal th uh, a cast issue where I think one, one of their cast members uh, contracted COVID, so she is stuck not doing anything for three days. <laughs> yeah, so she's so fine. She's fine, though. Yeah. <laughs> The glory of them all, it's God and God alone. God and God alone reveals the truth of all we call unknown. And all the best and worst of men won't change the master plan. It's God and God's alone. God and God alone is free to take the universe's throne. Let everything that lives reserve its truth. Nicely done, thank you. The Gospel reading is from Mark chapter 13. This chapter is sometimes called the little apocalypse. And um, apocalypse or apocalyptic um, literature um, is about revealing something. And uh, I had a teacher once who said, uh, think of, of an apocalypse as this, and he had a table with a a bunch of things on a table and it was covered by a sheet or cloth. The apocalypse is taking back the covering to reveal what's underneath, what's true and there. <clears throat> so this is in um, that vein, verses one through eight. 
As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. And Jesus asked him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of war, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdoms. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. For the word of God in Scripture, within us, among us, and beyond us, thanks be to God. Is a poem by K. Ryan from a collection called The Best of It. And this poem is titled The Things of the World. Wherever the eye lingers, it finds a hunger. The things of the world want us for dinner. Inside each pebble or leaf or puddle is a hook. The appetites of the world compete to catch a look. What does this mean? How does it work? Why aren't rocks complete? Why isn't green adequate to green? If we aren't gods whose gaze could save, but that's how the things of the world behave. I am fascinated by that poem. And that's what poets do, is bring us perspectives that I don't think I would ever have otherwise. To imagine that the things of the world are vying for your attention and mine. That's why the trees put out colored leaves. That's why uh, birds sing. They want us to pay attention. They're calling out to us to stop and take notice of them. That's what the poem suggests. And why not? If those things out there are invested with God's creativity and energy and love as we are and we believe they are, then why not stop and pay attention? Why not honor them and admire them and even love them, certainly respect them? I like that. And once you hear something like that, it's, it's hard to go back, and that's a good thing. Maybe we should read that poem every day. Maybe everybody in the world should read the poem every day. <laughs> But that one line, why aren't rocks complete, is the one that I stumbled over that stopped me. Why aren't rocks complete? Why do they need more? Maybe the incompletion is built into the system. Maybe the completion includes incompletion so that you and I need each other and we need other things and they need us. The temple in Jerusalem was a magnificent structure according to all reports. Um, it was covered in white marble and gold. And according to one commentator, um, the dimensions were five football fields long and three football fields wide. Now one of the participants in the Bible study on Tuesday morning, who shall remain nameless, but it was art, said, I didn't know that they had football back then. <laughs> Which I thought was really quick. And I didn't think of it. It was probably European football, not American, because that's older, I think, than, and more what's accepted around the world, right? Anyway, that temple was built by Herod the Great, or Herod the Great Builder, and I think he called himself that and got other people to call him that. I don't know uh, if you would, Gene, if you would call yourself Gene the Great, if that would catch on, but it, you know, it might be worth a try. Who knows? But 
that temple was um, one of those things that called out for attention, that when you, when you saw it, it, it spoke to you. you. You should stop and admire it in awe. And it was built that way. Well, one of the disciples, as Jesus and his disciples are coming out of the temple for the last time in what we call Holy Week, this is Jesus' last few moments in the temple. He's been arguing, disputing, uh, discussing things with the religious leaders, and now they're leaving. And one of the disciples um, is taken by this structure. It's impressive, and he just has to stop for a moment. Says, look at, just look at this thing. I mean, just before we go, let, you know, we should maybe take some pictures or something. And Jesus says, you're right. You should take pictures now, because it's not going to be there long. It's a human structure, and what goes up will come down, and this will come down. Now, the sort of the backdrop for this pronouncement Mark writes, in around the year 70, and the Jewish-Roman War is raging between 66 and 70. And this Jewish revolt takes place in Judea, Galilee, the whole region is in turmoil. They're trying to run the Romans out, and there's infighting amongst Jewish groups, the priests who don't want to get rid of the Romans because well, they're in collaboration with them, and the zealots who want to get rid of the Romans, and, and we should all fight to run them out, and they're battling back and forth amongst themselves as they battle the Romans. The Romans have their own issues. When they finally bust through the Romans in 70, in that first century of the Common Era, the conflagration brings the temple burning to the ground, and thousands upon thousands of Jewish lives come to an end. It's, it's horrendous. That's what's going on as Mark is writing his version of the Jesus story. And that's the backdrop for this particular text and what Jesus says. Now, when he says, no stone will be left upon another, we realize Mark is writing this 40 years after Jesus' life. Did Jesus really say that? He may have. Jesus did, I think, believe that the end was coming, that there was a new creation in the works, and so the temple and everything would be replaced. Was it simply because it would be knocked down in this change, or was this a theological, political pronouncement on Jesus' part, or on Mark's part, that this is what happens to structures when they don't honor God? This is what happens when the leaders of God's people reject God's chosen one. That would be part of Mark's argument, part of the argument of the, the early church, what's in the, what we call the New Testament. Well, whatever Jesus is saying there, it sort of stuns the disciples, and the curtain comes down. That's the end of that scene in the play. So if you imagine a stage curtain coming down, and then people backstage are scurrying around to change the scenery, because the next scene takes place outside of the city, on the Mount of Olives, which, um, if you read in Zechariah chapter 14, there's this passage where Zechariah predicts that this is where God will land when the final day comes. Um, uh, it's a tumultuous passage itself, but that's traditionally what is understood. The Mount of Olives is where God will arrive on the final day. And that is why, in part, Jesus comes into the city on what we call Palm Sunday from the Mount of Olives to sort of dramatize the coming of God into this city, whether God is accepted or not. Well, what Zechariah says about this day and this coming, Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives, sitting over against the temple, Mark tells us. Just like in the previous story where Jesus was seated over against the temple treasury, remember, with the widow who put the two coins in? It's not simply where he's located geographically. It's, a, again, a theological, political position. Jesus seats himself places himself over against the temple because of the temple corruption, and that is a large part of why he is as popular as he is. 
So he's made this pronouncement. And four of his disciples, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, come to him privately. So this probably shouldn't be in the book because this was just, you know, this was, uh, there should have been executive privilege on this. It shouldn't have been revealed. But they ask, when will this happen and how will we know that all of these things are about to be accomplished? Now, isn't it curious that they ask about all of these things? Because Jesus talks about one thing, doesn't he? At least the part that we hear. Now, maybe there was more conversation, but he talks about the destruction of the temple. But they're asking about all of these things, which doesn't it make you curious what all these things are? Jesus' response to them is equally interesting. He says, there will be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines and kingdoms rising against kingdom and people claiming to be the leaders, claiming to be God's chosen one, don't be led astray. That's not it. That's just what? The beginning. Well, the beginning of what? Well, the beginning of the end? The beginning of the bing? Beginning, he says this is the beginning of the birth pangs. So, labor begins. In, in a passage, I think it's in Romans, Paul talks about all creation groaning as if in labor, waiting for the children of God to be revealed, to be born. Is Mark reflecting that? Perhaps. But what Jesus talks about and describes feel and sound like endings, don't they? Wars, rumors of wars, kingdoms rising against kingdom. This is great disruption, pain, death. And the word that the disciples use to talk about all these things being accomplished is sun telestai. Sun telestai, I have to read it because it won't stick in my head. Sun telestai. And it, the, the, the root word is telos, sun telostai. And the telos is, is the, like in a telescope, it is the goal far out there, down in the future when all these things will be accomplished. There was a theologian in um, the last century, <laughs> uh, 1900s, um, named Teilhard de Chardin, who talked about the omega point, the telos, and that God is calling and inviting and beckoning and drawing all of creation, all of history to this omega point, alpha, omega, beginning and end, to this point of of, of completion, of consummation, everything coming into one, into completion within God's self. And Deschardins said God is already at that point, inviting all into God's self, beyond time, at the end of time, however you conceive of that. I was intrigued by that when I first heard about that, that idea way back in college. Astrophysicists tell us that the universe, or multiverse, but the universe is constantly expanding. So how can it be that God is calling everything into God's self, into, into oneness, as the universe itself is moving outward and everything is coming further, going further apart? Except, perhaps, that that speaks of the nature of God, this one who is infinitely loving, endlessly reaching out, whose heart, whose arms expand continuously to gather all things into God's self, not just the good and beautiful and loving and kind moments and things, but the brokenness, the hideous things, the awful things that we do that are done to us, that we experience, all of that. God is insistent, is going to be gathered into God's wholeness and completed and redeemed and made new and whole. Does that work for you? Something to ponder when you have nothing else to think about? Susie and Justin were married in 2004. I officiated at their wedding. 
They have four children. Two were born while we were still there, so I baptized those two children. And I was there when Susie's dad, Jim, died, and so I led his funeral service. Jim was a character. He's one of those people that the mold was broken after he was made, and it's probably just as well. But he was, he was fun. Um, you just never knew what was going to come out of him. He raised Susie by himself, and I don't remember if he was divorced or if his wife died. I do not remember, but he was a single father. And so she was a character, too. He rubbed off, as would have to be the case. Well, I got an email from Susie in July, and she said, do you remember me? Do you remember us? And you did our wedding. You remember my dad, Jim? And of course, I remembered him right away when I saw the name. Bingo, I could see them. And she, you know, chatted on a little bit, and then she sort of dropped this bomb. She said that Justin, her husband, had been diagnosed in April with um, esophageal cancer, stage four, and it wasn't looking good. And she had some questions for me and some requests for some assistance. And so I responded with what I could offer. And then I didn't hear from her for another couple months. And so thinking about them and her, I sent an email just wondering how things are. And sorry, I can't be of more help to you. Well, I got a response just this week. So my email was in October, it was almost, almost a month later that I heard from her, and she apologized, and she had this long story to tell me. Um, Justin loves football. He's a Vikings fan, which is sort of sad, I guess, but <laughs> it's, it's the way things are, and it's kind of like being a Cubs fan. There's just people who, uh, I guess, like suffering. And, um, but he loved football, he played high school football, loved high school football, and their son Chase is a senior this year and he's playing football. And because his dad wore 50, number 52 on his jersey when he was in high school, Chase chose to wear number 52 on his jersey in honor of his dad. And so Susie and Justin were watching all the games. They had some connection so that somebody was there with a, a phone or a camera or something that could stream the game so they could watch it from Justin's hospital room or if he was home, he wasn't strong enough to go. And so all the way along they were watching these games that Chase was playing in. And there was a big game coming up late September, early October, and it was a rematch with the team that had beat them two years ago in the state playoffs, and they wanted to win that really badly. It's revenge, you know, we have to have revenge. And everybody was getting excited for this game, and in the meantime, Justin comes home because there's nothing more they can do. So he gets, goes into hospice. And the week of this game, early in the week, um, he and Susie are talking, and he tells her that he had been lying in his bed looking out the window at the clouds, and he was seeing some things in the clouds that, that spoke to him and comforted him, some images. And then he said that God had come to him and reached out to him to bring him home, he said. Now, this, this is what he said. And he responded that he had one thing that he needed to do yet, if he could have time to do that. So that Friday night, Susie goes to the game because she needs to be there for Chase. And Justin's mom and sister come to stay with him because he can't be alone. And it must have been some game because it went into triple overtime. And Chase's team won in the end and the score was 52 to 50. Now, whether or not that means anything at all, it was very meaningful to them. And Justin died about eight hours later. He was 47. Susie said in the email that she thought that Chase's team had won because they had a 12th person on the field the whole game. It was a, another 52 was there. And that was her interpretation of things. When Jesus says this thing about the temple coming down, the end of it, and the disciples ask him, 
when will this be and how will we know that all of these things are coming into completion? Jesus says what? He says, it's going to feel like the world is falling apart, like it's going to hell in a handbasket, if you will. That's not it. That's just the beginning. Because in our end is our beginning, in our time, infinity, in our doubt, there is believing, in our life, eternity. For Justin and Susie, this all comes together with a fatal illness running its course and a football game that turned out as they hoped and this number showing up again and again and then again. And there's a sense of completion in this brokenness. And there is grief and there is loss and there is letting go. But there is this sense that it is somehow held in God and that they see in these things signs of God's presence and promise that it's not over. And so life redefined and, and launched again for them. At least that's how she sees it. When will these things happen? And how will we know that all of these things are coming to be, are being accomplished, being completed, coming into completion? Well, I don't think it happens just once. I think this is a metaphor and it happens again and again and again and again. So for some people it is happening right now. For others, it already has. For you and me, well, where are things? In our end is our beginning, in our time, infinity. In our doubt, there is believing in our life, eternity. In our death, a resurrection, at the last, a victory. Unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. Amen. Let's pray. Help us to see what you can see, God. To see as you see in love, in hope, in promise. To recognize where beauty and change come to awaken us, where brokenness and incompletion call out to us to stop pay attention, to offer ourselves, not because we can fix everything, but because we may be the missing piece, the expression of grace, the open heart another needs. As the World Climate Conference concludes, help us to be particularly attentive and careful in how we move about in the world and the ways we affect your world, which is our home for now and a place generations to come also need to be a welcoming home as well. We lift up those whom we know who are in need, who hunger, especially the people of Afghanistan right now, those who seek a stable, safe place to live in a hospitable community. We pray where that is happening and where it is not. We lift up those who seek and need healing. Connie Thompson, Marilyn Gress are both healing after knee surgery. Steve Varland, Ken Burris. Julie's family, especially her mom and dad and her brothers, Sam and Orville. Or Tom Whitry, who is healing up after a fall. 
for Barb Tillman's cousin and husband. From Haley for her grandfather, Bruce Westfall, um, preparing for back surgery while still mourning the loss of his wife and Haley's grandmother. For the students and staff of Watershed High School transitioning to distance learning due to high rates of COVID in their school population. For Marianne, for David and his move from the hospital to rehab, he's been through so many symptoms and pains and illness. We pray he improves and is able to go back home with his wife, B. From Sue Lundquist, prayer for her uncle Bob Meffert as he enters hospice with terminal cancer. Thank you. For B.J. Adams, healing after surgery. For Julia Karen, who's dealing with bone cancer and she's just a young woman. For Ryan, after a stem cell transplant, hoping for good results. Or Kendall, a young woman wrestling with mental health issues. For Connie Mahler, still hoping for some positive result in terms of her hearing that it might improve. And for Sally Turretin, healing after surgery as well. We lift up all of these persons and others whom we carry and know you do as well, God. as the trees bear themselves and the landscape becomes more open, perhaps we can as well to see and live more simply and clearly and generously. In Christ we pray. Amen. Has anybody gotten their stewardship letter with a uh, pledge card and all of that? Has that come yet? It's a good thing because it's not out. <laughs> uh, there's, there's a letter that has been written and the project is in the works, but um, our gift team, which was fairly decent size, now is down to just two of us. And um, we, you know that Doug Kozad was the leader of that group, and Doug died this summer, and so we're, we're limping along. So if anybody is really interested in being part of stewardship, I know, uh, don't, don't everybody run up here at once after the service, but if you're so moved, um, come and see me, would you? Like to hear from, or, or send me an email, that'd be fine too. But those things will be coming. We will have some sort of stewardship thing, but you can be thinking about that, and. Um, uh, perhaps how good it is to have a place to gather, even in a small group, and how important it is to have a community that you can look to, especially when you need it. All right. And inviting your generosity and your goodness and your grace, um, your kindness for one another, for this community, for the world, I thank you for that as it has been and as it will continue to be, and I invite you to join me in offering thanks. Would you stand as you are able? Let us pray. God of all, we see only partially and dimly, as Paul reminds us, but we are gaining a larger and fuller picture of how interconnected everything is and how our living affects the world you share with us. So help us to live in grateful, careful, and generous ways, giving what we can, reaching out in love and peace to heal, bless, and make complete and whole the brokenness around us and within. In the name of Jesus, whose hope for this world becomes ours as we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. Our closing hymn is Hymn of Promise. In every ending, every seeming place of brokenness, God envisions a beginning, a healing, a completion already underway. May we trust and watch for it as well. God send you, the Spirit fill you, Christ go with you, and you with Christ always and everywhere. Amen. God bless. Go in peace. Amen.